I found something called a Prestige HD Supreme Rose Edition television. <clears throat> and this television is, I guess it's on sale, it's only like 1.9 million. And it only has a 55 inch screen, but it's got, again, diamond studded, like alligator skin all over the place, and I'm like, for that much money, I would think it would be as big as this room or bigger, but that's okay. It's, uh, it's not the TV I have. A couple years ago, a Mexican billionaire bought a 1962 Ferrari 250 GTO from a British owner for a cool $35 million for one car, one car. And I would imagine that this guy really considers that his precious possession, right? Very precious. Um, ladies, for our handbags, there's, um, you know, there's a, already the Hermes um, Birkin handbag is already 10 grand. So it's already a little bit out of my price range. But you can, like, put some golden diamonds on that, and they do have Hermes bags that are over $1.9 million. Usually you would talk about like a Rolex watch being like the, the most expensive watch, but I found a watch by uh, Chopard. And again, lots and lots of beautiful uh, baubles on it, $25 million for a watch. And then if you're an art lover, if you've ever heard of um, Jackson Pollock, I, I, I saw a movie about him once. It's kind of all I know about this famous um, artist. But he has a, a painting called, let me make sure I get the, 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 uh, the title of this painting right. It's called Painting Number 5. <laughs> painting Number 5 sold for $140 million. And it's 4 foot by 8 foot, which, as the gentleman will probably tell you, it's the size of a piece of plywood because that's literally what he painted it on. He painted it on a piece of plywood, and it was sold for $140 million. So I just thought I would put out these, these ridiculous numbers because you know that these are people's cherished and prized possessions. But I thought tonight maybe we should talk about something a little bit of more affordable, I'll say that, Something that God has put in each and every one of us that should be our prized possession. And I'll give you a hint. It's not a thing. It's not a thing like that. According to the words of Jesus, he says in Matthew 16, 26, your most prized possession is your soul. What shall it profit a man or a woman if he or she gains the whole world and loses his or her soul? And what shall a man or woman give in exchange for his or her soul? Your soul is actually infinitely more valuable than anything, anything in this world, which is, which is very interesting because we just talked about some really high-end things. But if you think about it, as you, as you get to hang out in heaven, right, with the Lord, Forever and ever and ever and ever, you will actually outlast every single item that we just talked about, these million-dollar items. You will actually outlast every single Fortune 500 company. You will outlast money as we know it. You will outlast countries as we know it. You will outlast this ball of, of uh, whatever we are sky and earth and water you will outlast that you will outlast you will outlast the sun you will outlast everything because your soul will go on for all eternity so when we think about like million dollar things and we think about how we could never never all of those things will all be gone they will all tarnish and fade and be destroyed or whatever and you and your, your soul will continue to last. You will outlast everything that you see. You will outlast everything that you see, even things that you can't afford. So that makes it, that makes it pretty, uh, you're worth a lot. 
you're worth a lot. There was a time when you were not, but there will never be a time when you are not. You, when you're in heaven, hanging out with the Lord, you are going to last forever. I, I have to kind of, um, I have to like pull my brain back in because that blows my mind. It, I, can't, I can't quite wrap my head around all of that. If you can, then good for you, but I just, I, it's just too big for me. The truth is, well, it's too important to miss. And so let's read what Jesus had to say about your most precious possession, your very soul. Brittany's going to put up some, some, uh, some scripture for us. And so, thank you, lady. It is a, it's a little long, so, um, but I'm going to read it all. So you guys just hang on. It's, we're going to go for, we're going we're to read 11 verses. So if you want to go to Mark chapter 8, starting in verse 27, you can read it along with us in your Bible. And it says, but when Jesus turned and looked at his disciples, he rebuked Peter. Oh, wait. Go back a little bit. Is that 27? Yeah. Hold on. I'm going to start. I'm going to read. I'm going to start back at 27. Oh, there we go. I think that's it. Jesus and his disciples went on to the villages around Caesarea Philippi. And on the way, he asked them, who do people say I am? They replied, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and still others, one of the prophets. But what about you, he asked. Who do you say I am? And Peter answered, you are the Messiah. Good job, Peter. Jesus warned them not to tell anyone about him. He then began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders the chief priests, and the teachers of the law, and that he must be killed and after three days rise again. He spoke plainly about this, and Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But when Jesus turned and looked at his disciples, he rebuked Peter. Get behind me, Satan, he said. You do not have in mind the concerns of God, but merely human concerns. Then he called the crowd to him along with his disciples and said, Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it. But whoever loses their life for me and for the gospel will save it. What good it is for someone to gain the whole world, or what good is it for someone to gain the whole world, yet forfeit, forfeit their soul? Sorry, the red's a little. Or what can anyone give in exchange for their soul? I read that earlier, huh? If anyone is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, the Son of Man will be ashamed of them, when he comes into its Father's glory with the holy angels. Is that it? That's it. Gracias. So this message is actually about discipleship. And Jesus had an interesting conversation, an interesting interaction with his disciples, especially Simon Peter, right? But we throw this word around, disciple, but it's, a, it's kind of a Christian thing, right? You know, if you're not Christian, you're probably not going, oh, disciple this or disciple that, unless it's a, like a clothing brand, because there's a couple of those. What does disciple actually mean? The best translation of the New Testament word is that of a pupil or a follower, so like a student or a follower. But it, it captures the idea that you are a long-time follower, not a temporary follower, not just like, oh, I really like this fad, or I really like this, you know, this fashion thing, or I really want these shoes today, but I have no interest in them 10 years from now. It's not a short-term thing. Being a long-term follower and making like a 24-7 lifetime commitment, and I think we, that's all what we want to do. We want to be called to be a disciple by Jesus. But you can't be a disciple maker until you are 
a true disciple. Does that make sense? If you really want to teach somebody how to fix cars, but you've never even opened the hood of a car, you're going to have a little trouble. So we have to, we have to kind of pull back a little bit and figure out what does it take? How do I be a real disciple so that I can help others also learn about Jesus Christ? So we're going to run through five things fairly quickly this evening, but we're going to run through five ways, not ten, five ways that, uh, that we can be disciples. So the first one is believe and confess that Jesus is Lord. That's pretty good. Jesus was asking them, right? He is like, who do you say I am? And Peter usually would say the wrong thing. But this time, Peter gets it right on. He says, you are the Christ. You are the Christ. So this is about halfway through um, Jesus' three-year ministry. About halfway through. And he was being, he was usually uh, being pursued by people who wanted him to heal them or feed them. And, and I get it. That would have been pretty cool too. So they went off um, to a place called, a northern city in Galilee called Caesarea Philippi. And that was in our, in our things this evening. This is a pretty, uh, um, a pretty rough territory. Pretty rough, like meaning not, uh, not a lot of Christians were there. It would be like if, um, if we took everybody to a Christian retreat, but we didn't want to see one Christian. We would probably go to, I don't know, maybe Vegas or something. So, you know, although there are Christians there, I'm aware. But it's, it's, it was more of a sinful place. It's a pagan Roman city. And it had a temple dedicated to a half-man, half-goat god named Pan. And a huge spring gushed from a cave inside of a massive mountain. And the temple was built over this gushing spring. And they called it the Gates of Hades. Human sacrifice was done there in Caesarea Philippi. So again, not, not like the, the beautiful place where, where all of the Christians were hanging out. But it was time for Jesus to kind of evaluate and like, where are we headed? And where, what do you guys know? You're, you're my 12 people. What do you guys know? What have you, what have you caught by this point? And as, they, as the verses were saying, it was saying some people said that he was John the Baptist. Some people said that he was Elijah or one of the prophets. And I'm sure that they were probably all giggling at that because they clearly, they knew he was not any of those people. But the laughter dies down real fast when he says, but who do you, who do you say that I am? And that's when Peter piped up and said, you're the Messiah. You're the Christ. You're the Lord. And so today, you know, when we think about this, You've heard, you've heard a lot of people talk about Jesus. You've heard me talk about Jesus. You've heard other people talk about Jesus. If you grew up in a Christian home, you've heard about Jesus probably most of your life. But it's time for you to decide. What do you think? Who do you claim that Jesus is? What do you claim Jesus is? How is he hitting your heart today? What is he to you, right? Right? It's not enough for you to say or for anybody to say, well, my parents say, say that he's the son of God, right? It's not enough for your pastor to say, oh, well, Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. He says, who do you say that he is? The Bible says in Romans 10, 8, uh, Romans 10 9 and 10, if you confess with your mouth... Jesus is Lord, and you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is with your heart that you believe and are justified. And it is with your mouth that you confess that you are saved. So every year, um, every year, every Roman citizen had to go, and they were required to pay an annual tax. And they were required to say something when they paid this annual tax. They had to confess, Kaiser esten curios, which means Caesar 
is Lord. But the Christians, they would go and they would pay their tax, but they would say something different. They would say, Lesus estin curios, which means Jesus is Lord. If you wonder why the Christians were persecuted in the early church, this is why. They were radical and ornery, as can, you know, that's what the Roman, the Roman law would say. They say, nope, we're going to have to arrest you for treason. And that's often what they got in trouble for. They got in trouble because they wouldn't say, they wouldn't claim, right, that the Caesar at that time was Lord. I don't know if you've ever come to faith as a Christian. I don't know if you guys have been baptized yet, but if you have, usually when you're baptized, you would say, Jesus Christ is Lord, right? You usually make that confession, or you make that confession when you come to, to have Jesus as your personal Savior. This is the first step. This is the first step to being a disciple, is making sure you know what you're doing with Jesus. And admitting and confessing that Jesus Christ is Lord. All right, the next one is remove your ego from the throne of your life. And we saw this again in this scripture because Peter, well, Jesus said something very unexpected to Peter, right? He told him, get behind me, Satan. Like, who are you talking to? You know, Peter's probably like, what, what, uh, my name's not Satan, my name's Peter. Why are you saying, get behind me, Seder, Satan? You do not have in mind the things of God, but the things of men. And Jesus explains it a little bit more, and he says, if anyone would come after me, he must deny himself. So Peter made this powerful confession, and he said, oh, you're, you're Jesus, and you're the Messiah, and Everybody's like, good one, Peter. You did it. And so then proud Peter, proud Peter kind of came up and he was like, yeah, you see what I did there, right? I claimed it. I know it. I know more than you guys, right? But then Jesus, and it says in, in the scripture that we just read that Jesus said it plainly. And Jesus said, hey, guess what? So let me just tell you guys where we're headed you know, I need to tell you what's going to happen. We're going um, to have some problems. I'm going to suffer, right? I'm going to be rejected by the Jewish leaders. I'm going to die. And I'm going to be raised from the dead. We just read that Peter took Jesus aside and rebuked him. Peter was telling Jesus, he's like, look. We got a good thing going on here. Like, we're on the winning team. So could you just cool it with the whole you're going to be rejected thing, you're going to be killed thing. You're gonna, can we just pull that back, Jesus, because, like, everything is coming up roses here. I don't think we should talk about that. And that's when Jesus said. And Jesus didn't just say it to Peter, did he? It says he turned and said to the whole disciples, get behind me, Satan. Get behind me. <laughs> Peter was full of, of selfish pride at this point. He definitely was. His ego was in charge. And unless you, if you want to be a disciple, you've got to learn to deny yourself. You've got to deny yourself. And I'm not talking about like denying sweets, denying food, denying. You have to deny yourself. Yourself is is your ego. It's the big I. I, 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 I. You have to learn to deny that. We are sinners and our human nature makes us self-centered. Maybe that's a shocking revelation to some of you. But our human nature makes us selfish, makes us self-centered, and everything revolves around us, right? Imagine a circle that kind of represents your life. And in the middle of your life is a throne. In the middle of the circle is the throne. So in a self-centered life, who's on the throne? I am. I am. I'm on the throne. The big eye. I'm calling the shots. I'm doing what I want, right? 
And you can see all these other little circles of things that I'm kind of interested in, but everything's a little bit out of balance because God's not involved. God's not in charge, for sure. Some of the, some of the characteristics of a self-directed life and, and I, I recognize some of these things in my life are a legalistic attitude, impure thoughts, guilt, worry, discouragement, a critical spirit, frustration, aimlessness, and fear. The list goes on and on, but it also includes a poor prayer life and no desire, no desire to study the word of God. If this describes your life, you have to figure out if your ego lies in the center of your existence. A good acronym for ego is edging out God. So in the life of these self-centered people, which used to, used to be all of us, right, before we came to Jesus, but now we have a, a much greater chance of not being like this if we've got the Holy Spirit and we have empowered him to take over our life take over our life, we can now say it's not about me. It's all about Jesus. Can you guys say that out loud? It's not about me. It's all about Jesus. Let's do it one more time. It's not about me. It's all about Jesus. So the next one is maybe we can visualize our ego as dead, as absolutely dead, It says uh, in the Bible, it says, if anyone will come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross. If you've taken up your cross, you're hanging out in Jesus' day, what is the one, what is the only place you are going if you took up a cross? Are you going to a party? Are you going to a celebration? If you are carrying a cross... You are going to your death. In Jesus' case, right, he went up the, up, up the hill called Golgotha, and they put the cross there, and they hung him on it. If you are carrying your cross, you have one destination. That is your death. And that, I get it. You, you just freak, I'm freaking you out right now. But when we talk about your cross to bear... We talk about your cross to bear, and some people say, oh, you know, that's, you know I've got bad health, and, and that's my cross to bear. Jesus is not talking about your aches and your pains. That might be part of your life, but I don't know that that's your cross to bear because we all have the same cross to bear. The cross we have to bear is going to our, our, the death of our ego, the death of our self. And we have to do this every single day. So I love this verse. It's Galatians 2.20. And I'll, I'll tell you how this verse has helped me wrap my mind around this concept. Because this concept is not a pretty concept. But let me tell you how this, how this verse helped me. Galatians 2.20. It says, I have been crucified with Christ and I no longer live. But Christ lives in me. The life I live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. I love that verse. I've actually, I've preached on that verse other times. It, I have like all this, oh, thanks, sweetie. I have, um, I have it in my, my Bible all highlighted. I have some notes on it. And I was like, this is great. This is great. But this is pretty spiritual, This is pretty, like, high thinking, maybe, you know, like, I I think I wrote a paper on it once. Like, this this is a little highfalutin in some ways, right? And sometimes you feel like you just can't sink your teeth into, (laughs) into, I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. If you can't sink your teeth into it, right, it's like you're trying to chew Cool Whip. But the Lord helped me because one day I was reading, I was reading the, the story of Jesus' crucifixion, and this came to me. I was like, wait, wait, wait. I actually, I know somebody who was literally 
crucified with Christ, and I'm going to meet him in heaven. I know him. His story is written in the Bible, right? It was the thief on the cross. And as he hung there, he knew his life was about to end. And he looked over to Jesus, also bleeding and dying, right? And did Jesus look like a king? Probably not at that point. Probably not. And what did he say to him? He said, Lord, remember me today when you go into your kingdom. And Jesus said, done. Today you will be with me in paradise. So when we're crucified with Christ, we're like the thief on the cross. We're like the thief on the cross. And that, that has helped me because if you think about the thief on the cross who's hanging there, and I don't know all of his sins, I don't know all of his issues, Mr. Thief on the Cross, we don't even know his name, I'll figure it out in heaven, but I'm sure that whatever his, whatever his, uh, his vices were, I'm sure that at that point, when he is dying on the cross, he is next to Jesus, he is begging Jesus for his life, I bet the most beautiful-looking prostitute could have walked right in front of that cross. And the thief on the cross would not be interested at all. I bet at that point, like one of the Roman soldiers, he could have rolled up in like a diamond-encrusted chariot. Best chariot ever, just like a Ferrari, right? The most amazing chariot. And the thief on the cross would say, eh, I'm a little busy with Jesus, right? I bet one of the Pharisees could come up to the foot of the cross, and he had like a mink, a mink prayer shawl, maybe, you know, like all blinged out, maybe like some velvet headdress, fancy stuff, right? And he would not have said, hey, I love that outfit. Could you get me one of those? He was crucified with Christ, so none of those things mattered. None of those things mattered. The only thing that mattered was what? Jesus. Jesus. So put yourself on that cross with Jesus. Look into Jesus' eyes and lose the desire to look at anything else. That's how, that's how I got that beautiful verse, Galatians 2.20, to come alive for me. I am the thief on the cross. I am begging Jesus to save me. I am that soul that is going to live on and on and on much, much longer than my fleshly desires, longer than that fancy chariot, longer than the, the, mink, the mink prayer shawls. My soul will live on and on and on and on, Galatians 2.20. Number four. So we're going to place Jesus on the throne, and we're going to obey him. And that's what he said, right? He said, if anybody comes after me, he must take up his cross and... Follow me. Follow me. Follow me. So to follow Jesus means you go where he goes, right? Have you guys ever um, been on the beach? And I know with my kids, you would, we would walk along the beach, and they tried to um, like walk right in my footsteps so that they didn't have any little footsteps of their own, right? You can kind of then like, Make your footsteps like big, or you can run in circles, and then they're trying to figure out how to follow you, and it, it just kind of ensues into madness, right? And by the way, moms and dads and aunts and uncles and teachers and everybody, you are making tracks for kids to follow. So following Jesus means to walk in his footsteps. It doesn't mean you have to be perfect. Thank goodness. Thank goodness, we all fall short. But you must desire to follow Jesus. You must desire. So imagine another circle, right? It represents your life. But in this, in this circle, yourself, your big, your big ego, all about me, 
has stepped down off the throne and Jesus has gotten up on the throne. And then we can see love, joy, peace, patience, goodness, kindness, gentleness, and self-control. The fruit of the Spirit. That's what happens when Jesus is on the throne and not you and not me. Because we're kind of messy. Last one, don't waste your life. Instead, lose your life in God's cause. God's cause. Jesus, he talked in parables. He talked in all sorts of things that, that sometimes were um, hard to understand. And he said that. He said, not everybody's going to get this. But for us, when we dig a little bit below the surface, we see the truth. Jesus said, for whoever wants to save or live for me only, right, our life, will lose it, will waste it. They will waste it. But whoever loses or surrenders his life for me and for the gospel will save it because a life, your soul is going to exist for eternity. So a lot of people don't know that they have a soul. Have you ever asked Siri? Siri, do I have a soul? Siri will say, I never really thought about it. Thank you, Siri. Again, we should probably not be going to Siri for the answers to the big questions. But, but it, is, it is quite sad when people don't think that they have a soul, when they don't think about living forever. And forever is a very strange word. For all eternity, like there is no end. To be with the Father, it will not end. That's what your soul is going to do. That kind of makes this whole life not quite as important as we think it is. It's only important in the way that we become a disciple. A disciple. So, are you a disciple of Jesus? Do you believe, right? Have you confessed that Jesus is Lord? Are you denying yourself and taking up the cross and following Jesus? Are you ready to lose your life in God's great cause? I'm just going to finish with a story. Dietrich Bonhoeffer. Anybody ever heard of him? He's, you hear a lot about him if you've studied him in seminary and stuff like that. And he's a Christian martyr. You guys know what martyr means? That means his, his life ended in, in ways that were for Jesus. He was martyred. But he was a German pastor, and he knew a thing or two about discipleship. In fact, he wrote a book called The Cost of Discipleship. And honestly, he was, very, he was worthy to write this book because he really he showed us what the cost was. When Christ calls a man, he bids him come and die. He was talking about dying to self, right? But Bonhoeffer came to understand that dying, denying self, sorry, and taking up the cross sometimes leads to physical death as well. So from the beginning of Hitler's rule in Germany, Bonhoeffer always opposed him. Hitler used the German church, which is an interesting historical fact. Hitler used the German church to spread his message of Aryan supremacy and hatred towards Jews. And Bonhoeffer was a part of a small splinter group um, called the Confessing Church, is what it was called, that saw the evil in Hitler's leadership. Hitler was called de Führer, right, which means the leader. And Bonhoeffer was speaking on the radio in Berlin once and and he said, you know what? There was only one Führer for Christians, and that is Jesus Christ. He did not even get to finish his message in that radio address. They pulled the plug immediately. Hitler and his, and his uh, minions, they pulled the plug, and he, uh, <laughs> he, he, his, his radio show was canceled. He actually was arrested by the Gestapo and spent two years in concentration camps. 
So three weeks before the, the war in Germany ended, three weeks before he would have been liberated, Bonhoeffer was led out of the prison with several other prisoners led out of the building, not let out. He was led out of the building, the prison building. They were ordered to strip naked and they were led to the gallows to be hung. A physician who claimed to witness Dietrich Bonhoeffer's death later wrote, I saw Pastor Bonhoeffer kneeling on the floor, praying fervently to God. And I was so deeply moved by the way this lovable man prayed, so devout and so certain that God heard his prayer. At the place of execution, he again said a short prayer and, claimed, and climbed the few steps to the gallows, brave and composed. His death ensued after a couple seconds. And in almost 50 years, he said, that I, is, I, that I have worked as a doctor, I have hardly seen a man die so entirely submissive to the word of God. But in Pastor Bonhoeffer's last letter to a friend in England, he wrote this. He wrote, this is the end. But for me, it is the beginning of life. It is the beginning of life. And you might be thinking, that's so sad. That's so tragic, right? He lost his life. But he didn't actually lose it. He gained it. He lost himself in a cause greater than himself and as a result has impacted millions of disciples. Even you today have heard his story once again. So what is your most precious possession? It is your soul. Make sure that you are not wasting it. <laughs> Instead, lose it in a cause greater than yourself. Paul declared, I decided to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. Your soul will go on and on and on and on, and it will outlast everything you see and touch. That is your most prized possession. So let's take care today to be a disciple and to tell others to disciple others because this is what God has called us to do. Let's all stand and pray tonight. Father God, we, um, we thank you, Lord, for this great reminder of what our most prized possession is. Lord, I thank you that, that you reminded me and, and all of us here today, Lord, that our soul goes on and on and on. Lord, we think that the things that we do have nobody cares or nobody sees or it doesn't make any difference. But Lord, the truth is, is that our souls are, are so precious. They're so precious to the one who created them, and that's you, Lord. Lord, I ask that you would help us to confess with our mouth that you are Lord, Lord, and then to to continue to pick up our cross, deny ourself, Lord, and follow you. Lord, it's what we were called to do. It's what we were made to do. Lord, in fact, until we're doing it, we will never even be happy or satisfied. Why we do anything else, Lord, is just foolishness. Lord, help us today to take care of our most prized possession, our soul, Lord, and continue to just turn it over to you every single day. We love you, Lord. We thank you for your goodness and your truth, and we thank you for helping us every day to this end. We love you, Lord. In the name of Jesus, we all pray. Amen. Amen.